Um, Alright, I'm Riley Burton, and today I'm going to be talking about Pell's Equation. So, uh, first off, Pell's Equation is a Diophantine equation, the form x squared minus dy squared equals 1, uh, where x and y are non-negative integers, and d is a positive integer and is not a square number. And so for any Diophantine equation, uh, number theorists like to ask the following three questions. Uh, the first, does a solution exist? Um, the second, if so, how many solutions does it have? And third, can we actually find these solutions explicitly? Um, so in the previous talk, we saw an answer to the first question for Pell's equation, and in this one, uh, I'll be answering questions two and three. Um, and I just wanted to point out, in a typical problem involving Pell's equation, we're given a value of d and asked to find solutions x, y, so that the equation holds true. Okay, now for some background information, really just definitions of uh, terms that'll come up. First is a quadratic third, and a quadratic third is any number of the form a plus b times the square root of d where a and b are rational numbers, and d is an integer and not a square. A uh, quick note is that all the quadratic thirds we'll be dealing with will have integer coefficients, and by coefficients I mean these numbers a and b here. Uh, and then next we have third conjugate, or sometimes I'll probably just call it conjugate. Uh, and so given a quadratic third alpha, which is equal to a plus b squared of d, say, uh, it's third conjugate, which we give this little bar over the top. It's just given by a minus b squared of d. And last, we have the norm. And so given a quadratic third alpha, the norm of alpha is defined by just alpha times its conjugate. And so just a quick example, if we let alpha be the quadratic third 3 plus 2 times the square root of 2, then its conjugate is 3 minus 2 square root of 2, and the norm of alpha is equal to 3 plus 2 squared of 2 times 3 minus 2 squared of 2, which is 3 squared minus 2 times 2 squared, which equals 1 after you simplify it. All right, now I've got some useful properties that'll be coming up as well. Uh, so just let alpha and beta be quadratic thirds. Uh, then the first property is that alpha times beta is also a quadratic third. Uh, that's just saying quadratic thirds are closed under multiplication. Uh, next, the norm of alpha times beta is equal to the norm of alpha times the norm of beta. Uh, that's saying the norm is multiplicative. The third is that the norm of a quadratic third is equal to the norm of its conjugate. And the last one is that if the norm of alpha equals 1, then the conjugate of alpha is equal to the inverse of alpha, or 1 over alpha. So now I'm going to moving on to the second section, which is answering the second question, which is how many solutions does Pell's equation have? Uh, I'm going to start with a lemma that says, uh, so let alpha be a quadratic third with integer coefficients, then the norm of alpha equals 1, if and only if the coefficients of alpha are a solution to Pell's equation. So uh, this is kind of why we're working with quadratic thirds and the norm, uh, because if you have just any quadratic third, it's pretty straightforward to compute its norm, and then if that equals 1, then you know the coefficients of your quadratic third are a solution to Pell's equation, which is really nice. So here's the proof. Uh, so first, observe that for any quadratic third, you have the norm of, say, x plus y squared of d is equal to x plus y squared of d times its conjugate, which is x minus y squared of d, which after some algebra just boils down to x squared minus dy squared. And so if we let our alpha have uh, the integer coefficients a and b, then we get the norm of alpha is equal to a squared minus db squared. And then since we have the norm of alpha and a squared minus db squared being equal to each other, if the norm of alpha is equal to 1, then we know a, b is a solution to Pell's equation, and vice versa, because recall that if a, b is a solution to our Pell equation, then it satisfies a squared minus db squared equals 1. Alright, next, we have theorem 2.1, which says, 
the Fell equation x squared minus dy squared equals 1 has infinitely many solutions as long as d is greater than 0 and d is not a square. Uh, so we saw uh, why it only has finitely many solutions when d is less than or equal to 0 or d is a square in the last talk. Uh, but here's the proof now of it having infinitely many solutions. Uh, so recall from Chloe's talk that we know there exists a non-trivial solution to our Pell equation, and let's just let AB be that solution. So now let's consider the quadratic third with uh, A and B as its coefficients, and call it alpha. Observe that by repeated use of property 1, which is right there. Uh, we know alpha to the n is a quadratic third for all non-negative integers n, uh, because you can Oh, sorry, because you can kind of imagine taking this and expanding out to alpha times alpha times alpha n times, and then it's just uh, the product of a whole bunch of quadratic thirds, which is another quadratic third by property 1. And so let's, as this next line says, let the coefficients of this quadratic third be a sub n and b sub n. And then by lemma 2.0, which we just proved, but there it is again. Since AB is a solution to our Pell equation, we know the norm of alpha is equal to 1. And then by repeated use of property 2, which is right there, uh, we have the norm of alpha to the n is equal to the norm of alpha quantity to the n, which is equal to 1. Because kind of similar to the last one, you can imagine uh, expanding this out to norm of alpha times norm of alpha times norm of alpha n times. And then since this is norm of alpha is equal to 1, uh, then we just get 1 to the n, which equals 1. And so by lemma 2.0, we can see that a sub n, b sub n is also a solution for all n in the set of non-negative integers. And then it can be shown that a sub n and b sub n are strictly increasing sequences, so these solutions are unique, and therefore we have infinitely many of them. All right, next on to section 3. Uh, we'll be answering question three, which is how do you actually find the solutions explicitly? And so unfortunately, due to timing, I won't be proving these lemmas, but their proofs are fairly straightforward if you make use of the properties from the beginning. Uh, they're really just algebraic manipulation and uh, some inequality stuff. Uh, so the first is lemma 3.0, which says, if x squared minus dy squared equals 1, and x plus y squared d is greater than 1, and x is greater than 1, and y is greater than 0. And the next is lemma 3.1, which says, so suppose we have x squared minus dy squared equals 1, and a squared minus dv squared equals 1, where x, y, a, and b are all non-negative integers. Uh, then we have a plus b squared a d, it's less than x plus y squared of d if and only if a is less than x and b is less than y. So basically, these quadratic thirds only satisfy this property if and only if their coefficients do. Alright, now onto the theorem. So assume x squared minus dy squared equals 1 has a non trivial solution in positive integers and let x1, y1 be such a solution where y1 is minimal. Then all solutions to x squared minus dy squared equals 1 in integers up to sine can be generated from x1, y1 by taking powers of the quadratic third with x1 and y1 as its coefficients. Uh, so that is, all solutions are given by xy, where x plus y squared of d is plus or minus some power of x1 plus y1 squared of d, and then n is just an integer. Uh, and we call x1 plus y1 squared of d the fundamental solution to the Pell equation, or sometimes I've seen it called the minimal solution, but same thing. Uh, so here's the proof. So suppose we have x, uh, x and y in the set of integers that satisfy x squared minus dy squared equals 1, and if x and y are positive, we'll show that x plus y squared of d is equal to some power, or some positive integer power of x1 plus y1 squared of d. Um, and then we'll look at the case for x and y, uh, not both positive in a little bit. Uh, 
So first, notice that the sequence of numbers x1 plus y1 squared d to the n are an increasing sequence that starts at 1 and tends to infinity, uh, because this chunk in here, x1 plus y1 squared d, is a positive integer plus a positive integer, which is greater than 1. So we have some, something greater than 1 to the n, which is increasing, so that goes to infinity. Um, and then since x and y are greater than or equal to 1 by our assumption right here, uh, notice that x plus y squared of d is greater than 1. Uh, therefore, we know that x plus y squared of d either equals or lies in between two powers of x1 plus y1 squared of d. So here we have x plus y squared of d kind of sandwiched in between two powers of x1 plus y1 squared of d, and then where n is just some non-negative integer. Uh, so if we divide the above equation by x1 plus y1 squared of d to the n, we get this inequality. So 1 is less than or equal to x plus y squared of d times x1 plus y1 squared of d to the minus n, which is less than x1 plus y1 squared of d. Um, then if we use a, combinations of properties, a combination of properties 1 and 4, which are right there, uh, we can see that this x1 plus y1 squared of d to the minus n is also a quadratic third. So that middle term, x1 plus, or x plus y squared of d times x1 plus y1 squared of d to the minus n, is just a product of two quadratic thirds and itself is a quadratic third. Uh, and then let's just let a plus b squared of d be this quadratic third. So there it is. And then using this, the inequality we had before you don't remember, it's right here. Uh, when you substitute in a plus b squared of d for the middle part, uh, it just becomes this. And then, so notice now we have two cases. First is one is less than a plus b squared of d, and the second is one equals a plus b squared of d. So let's look at the first case, one is less than a plus b squared of d. And then so because a plus b squared of d is greater than 1, then by lemma 3.0, we know a and b are greater than 0. And there's the two lemmas, so you don't have to remember them. Uh, and then however, by lemma 3.1, this means that b is less than y1, which is a contradiction, because remember at the very start of the theorem, we defined y1 to be minimal. Uh, so thus, we must have the other case, y, or 1 equals a plus b squared of d. So let's look at that. So recall a, just the definition of a plus b squared of d. It's x plus y squared of d times x1 plus y1 squared of d to the minus n, which is just this fraction, x plus y squared of d over x1 plus y1 squared of d to the n. And then because a plus b squared of d is equal to 1, this implies that the top and the bottom are equal to each other. Sorry, that thing is covering it up. Uh, and because x and y were both defined to be positive, we know n does not equal 0, so we can conclude n is greater than or equal to 1. So uh, basically we've just proven that x plus y squared of d is some positive integer power of x1 plus y1 squared of d, just like we wanted. Um, so the case for x and y not being both positive follow exactly the same argument, or almost exactly the same argument, so I won't really be proving it rigorously to save some time, uh, but if you make some use of the properties, they're pretty much the same exact thing. And also some intuition as to why this might work is because if you imagine plugging in negative numbers into our Pell equation, we'll be squaring them anyways, so it doesn't really make a difference. And then for the final case where we have xy is equal to plus or minus 1, 0, then we must have x1 plus y1 squared of d to the 0. That's that. And I'm going to have I'm going to show an example of kind of this theorem in action. Uh, so we'll be finding the fundamental solution and generating all solutions for the Pell equation x squared minus two y squared equals one. So I guess the first thing to kind of notice is that our d value is equal to two. Um, and so let's start by finding the fundamental solution. Uh, so recall to find the fundamental solution x one y one must find the non-trivial solution to this uh, Pell equation in positive integers uh, such that y1 is minimal. And so 
uh, first, uh, notice we can just rearrange our Pell equation to x squared equals 1 plus 2y squared. And then we can just plug in integer values of uh, for y until 1 plus 2y squared is a square number. And then we'll know that x will be the square root of that number. Uh, so here we go. Here's I've made like a table. Uh, I guess the first question to ask is um, how come I didn't start at uh, y equals 0? So that would be because if y equals 0, the only solution to our Pell equation would be uh, 1 plus or minus 1, 0. Uh, so that is the trivial solution. And remember, we need the non-trivial solution for the fundamental solution. Uh, so we start at y equals 1. Then we see 1 plus 2y squared is equal to 3. This is not a square, so we don't take a value for x. But when we plug in 2, 1 plus 2y squared equals 9. This is a square, so we take x equals 3. So therefore, our fundamental solution, x1, y1, is 3, 2. Um, quick note, uh, this probably isn't the greatest method in general, because you can imagine if your uh, uh, minimal y value is pretty large, you'd have to make a pretty big table, which is time consuming and not very efficient. Uh, but there is a really nice algorithm for finding the fundamental solution that uses continued fractions. I unfortunately don't have enough time to talk about it now, but if you're interested, I encourage you to Google it. Um, so now I have like an example. So uh, for the case when our d is equal to 13, uh, the minimal y value is uh, 180. So you can imagine we'd have to have a table with 180 lines, which is pretty nasty, but even better if we have d equals 61, we have that huge number for y, that's the minimal solution, so our table would need to have this many uh, rows, sorry that thing is covering it up, uh, so yikes. Uh, so now uh, let's consider the quadratic third with coefficients x1 and y1, so 3 plus 2 squared of 2. And then uh, we'll now be able to generate all solutions to our Pell equation by taking powers of this quadratic third. And here's a whole bunch of them in a giant table. And then if you imagine extending off into the negative direction and then into the positive direction down here, uh, this is actually a complete set of solutions. So uh, that's it. Thanks for watching.